Please stand. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you know that we are set in the midst of many grave dangers. And because of the frailty of our nature, we cannot always stand upright. Grant that your strength and protection may support us in all dangers and carry us through every temptation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. first reading is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, beginning with the fourth verse. Now the, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 
chapter 14, beginning with the 12th verse. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For I, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking, be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to the people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, they will not say that you are out of your minds. But if the pro or prophesy an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you. And Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman there who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. The Gospel of the Lord. to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing you, we may also obey your will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Pardon me once. Uh, actually, that uh, bit of music you just played, is that ahead? Are you playing that later in the service? No. Well done. No, I, I'm with you. She's heard the sermon already. <laughs> Liturgical fun, folks. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. You are scrolling through the news or Facebook or whatever social media thing you're on the most. And suddenly you come across a post or a story from someone and immediately it gets under your skin. Maybe it's something snide or hateful or divisive. Maybe it's something just plain stupid that someone has posted. Maybe it's something you actually need to hear, but don't want to. <laughs> it's the easiest thing in the world in those moments to just keep scrolling. Easier still to click that one little button, unfollow. It's so very easy. I think it's possible to have a social media experience in which we never face anything that challenges us or represents a different point of view, and then the internet can just become for us an echo chamber of self-justification for everything that we already think and say and do. You know, we like having our egos nursed. I do. Right? We like having our egos nursed. We hate the idea that maybe, just maybe, we don't have it all together and aren't perfect. I don't like that idea about myself. That there could be something in my life that isn't okay, something that maybe needs to change. We don't like this, and this is nothing new. And I can prove it to you, because today's gospel lesson picks up right where we left off last week. Jesus, in his hometown synagogue, has just read the words of the prophet Isaiah, and he tells to them that today, there, in their midst, the prophecy has been fulfilled right in front of them. Scripture says at that point, all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? I want to translate, uh, try to translate how that might sound here uh, in, in the American South. Listen to him. He's so gracious. Prophecy fulfilled right here in Nazareth. Look what a great preacher our own town produced. Son of that carpenter down the street. Can you believe it? 
we must be pretty great. I think we've arrived. And then, if you were paying attention to that gospel lesson, things take a turn pretty quickly. Jesus says, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, I say to you, no prophet was acceptable in his hometown. But I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, and a great famine came all over the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now, I'm going to do a little bit more translating of how that might sound to, correctly for our ears. Jesus is essentially saying to them, I'm not welcome here. Don't think you got it all figured out and everything is awesome. And no, I will not be doing a song and dance act for your entertainment or so that you can feel more self-satisfied. I haven't said that prophecy's been fulfilled here because Nazareth is the next hot up-and-coming town on the map. This ain't about you. You neither own me nor can you lay any claim to my miraculous power. He said that to him in church, y'all, in the middle of church. And what does the Bible tell us happens next? When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill in which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. Talk about clicking unfollow. <laughs> Jesus tells the folks in his own hometown something they don't want to hear. Namely, that they aren't the center of the universe. But his words here and that challenging edge that these words carry are also an invitation. It's an invitation out of assuming that everything about me is great and nothing in my life or my heart or my practices or my habits might need to change or mature or be transformed. Jesus' words are an invitation to the people gathered there in the synagogue and an invitation to each of us, an invitation to begin afresh the journey of repentance. And the journey of repentance actually leads every person to the real center of the universe. Do you know where the real center of the universe is? It's Jesus. The Sunday school answer applies here. But the people in Nazareth are so wrapped up in self-justification, so convinced they've got everything figured out, that they literally try to kill the Son of God by throwing him over a cliffside. And then comes the truly sad part about this passage of Scripture. Passing through their midst, he went away. They have said to him, in effect, we don't want you here, and he obliges. He goes away. Scripture, for the Christian, is not an exercise in the power of positive thinking. Otherwise, we wouldn't get hard texts like this one. This is a hard text to preach on, just, but we're going to get through it, okay? Everybody take a deep breath. We're going to get through this. <laughs> Scripture is not an exercise in the power of positive thinking. Christianity is not a matter of intellectually agreeing with the right things and checking a box the gospel is not a matter of putting positive energy out into the universe and magically getting what we want. Nor is the gospel some sort of mantra like, I am incredible, you are incredible, everyone and everything is incredible, and we are just marching toward more incredibleness, always. The gospel is that Christ is risen from the dead, and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's good news. And the good news is holistic. It includes the bad news about ourselves. Do you know the bad news? You know the bad news about me? It's the same bad news about you. We cannot save ourselves. We can't come from the right place or be born into the right family in a way that would save us. We cannot try hard enough. We can't develop enough skills for self-actualization. We can't be altruistic enough. We are, each of us, sick with sin. We need the ongoing 
therapeutic healing of a master physician if we are to be saved. And oh, how often we think that we are that master physician, yours truly included. It's not that I don't like what I hear when I hear the good news. I want that. I want to be known and loved. I want to experience the healing grace of Jesus. I want to be led into deeper transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to be what St. Peter says in the New Testament that we become in Christ. Do you know this? We become partakers of the divine nature. Sit with that for a moment. That should, that should boggle the mind, but it's in there. I want all of these things. Yes, Lord, but I would rather just make it happen on my own and do it all by myself, you know? Because it might get that transformation in Jesus. That might get uncomfortable if I have to change certain habits or to allow certain passions to be brought into deeper submission. It might not make me feel great about myself if I have to face the anger or the anxiety that I often put in the driver's seat of life. I'm worried. What will happen if I really let Christ draw nearer and nearer to my heart? Because then I might have to revisit old wounds. I might even have to admit some things that I cannot control. Does this sound familiar to you at all? Maybe. Maybe it's just me. But if it sounds familiar to you, then I invite you this morning to face the music with me. See, there is a little bit of bad news in the good news. It includes the bad news about ourselves right up front. And this is why the gospel means freedom. For freedom Christ has set you free, says St. Paul. Freedom from what? Sin the devil, death, and freedom from myself. You can't control life. That might sound like bad news at first, but really let it sink in. You can't control life, and you were never meant to, because Jesus Christ is already the one in whom all things hold together. Your past, the things that you have suffered or the hurts that you have handed out to others, your successes, your failures, none of these are the full story because you were created for adoption by God the Father. You do not have to hide your hurts or your fears from anyone in this room, let alone from God Almighty, as if you could because the Holy Spirit is already everywhere present, filling all things. I said earlier that the good news is holistic because it includes the bad news about the sickness of sin that we all bear. But the good news is also holistic in the sense that it is meant to be a matter of ongoing, daily, weekly, seasonally, ongoing trust in the peace and the presence of Christ. Which is to say that ultimately, Christianity is a matter of transformation of the human person into the likeness of Jesus Christ, from one degree of glory to another. St. Paul says it. Look in the New Testament. It's a big deal. It is meant to be transforming. We are meant to be the place where heaven and earth collide. And the way up to that kind of transformation, as many saints have said, that way up is the way down. We follow Christ. Where does Jesus go from the cross? He first descends to the place of death, to darkness. And only then does he ascend to the right hand of the Father. And it's the same with us, his followers. We are meant to go down. Throughout our lives, we are meant to go down into the reality of our hearts as they actually are, facing whatever is there. Sin, anxiety, hopes, fears, disorder, everything facing our hearts as they are, waiting there. In our hearts, in a place that's often dark, right? This is typically not comfortable. This is not a comfortable part of the Christian life. Sometimes we wait in the darkness of our hearts longer 
than we think we can. Sometimes we wait longer than we think we ought to. But God is faithful. And by the grace of your baptism, the one who goes down into the reality of their heart throughout life, hearing those hard words from Jesus, exposing who they are to him, that one will always, and I mean always, eventually hear the gates of their own personal hell start to tremble as the Holy Spirit of God rushes in and lifts your soul by the resurrection power of our God in a foretaste of the lifting that even our bodies will experience on the last day. Some of that might be uncomfortable throughout the Christian life, but it's worth it. Did you hear the words of the hymn we sang a moment ago? Hmm. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. What I'm telling you is that it's worth the risk. This whole Christianity business, it's worth the risk. Worth the risk of letting Jesus tell you things you might not want to hear about yourself from time to time. It's worth the risk of letting him begin afresh in you today the slow, maybe even uncomfortable work of healing. It's worth the risk because even though it might not always be easy, the alternative to healing in Christ is nothing. There is no other way of becoming fully human on either side of eternity save through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And can I tell you something? I told the folks at the earlier service this too. This transformation I'm talking about, painful, slow though it may be, can I let you in on a secret as your pastor? It's happening in you. I've been here long enough now. I can look at your faces. I know your names. I know stories of exactly the kind of dross that God is consuming and exactly the kind of gold that he is refining in your life. Thanks be to God. It's worth that risk of drawing near to Jesus, even though we might not know what comes next. I want to close by reading a bit to you from The Silver Chair by C.S. Lewis, mostly because C.S. Lewis can get my point across from within Narnia better than I can from within the pulpit, because he's C.S. Lewis, right? In the scene that I'm going to read to you, a young girl, Jill, She's been wandering in the forest without water for a very long time. She's all alone. She knows if she doesn't find water to drink, she's going to die soon. She comes upon a beautiful, clear stream and starts toward it, and then just in time realizes that an enormous lion is between her and the water. So she freezes. The lion, of course, we know, is Aslan, the great Christ figure in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series. Jill, the character, she has no idea, though. All she knows is that something very unpredictable and perhaps a little scary lies between her and this life-giving water. I want to read this to you. and Bear in mind, the lion is Jesus Christ himself. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I am dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. And I ask myself, myself, how many times do I say that to the Lord Jesus? Would you mind going somewhere else while I try to heal? The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. 
As Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious, rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come? said Jill. How often do I ask Jesus that? I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she'd come a step nearer. Do you eat girls? she asked. I've swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. stand together. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, and Mark, our Bishop, for Chip, our Bishop, co-adjudicator, for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our president, our governor, and our mayor, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, sickness, need, or any other adversity, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. You are invited to add your prayers either silently or aloud.
Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's greet one another. Please be seated if you would. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Chance. I'm the pastor of this here church. Glad to see you all here. Welcome to everybody joining us online as well. Glad that you are with us. Dang, look how full that choir loft looks. They are sounding pretty darn good, too. If I, I, Yeah, just so you know. What? Ladies, you are being called upon. More women in the choir. Uh, there's a number of announcements, so I'm going to jump right in. Tomorrow evening at 5.30 is our annual parish meeting right across the way there in Gravely Hall. We're going to eat a bunch of fried chicken and whatever side dishes uh, you lovely folks decide to bring. You can RSVP for annual meeting right here on your Connect card. At the annual meeting, uh, we will do the business of the church, which uh, you'll receive the annual report that will tell you, you know, what different ministries in the church have been up to in the last year. We will elect new members to vestry and to the Trinity Foundation and delegates for Diocesan Convention. And that sounds like it's going to take a long time, but Lord willing, it's not going to. Um, we will have the opportunity to thank the vestry members who are rolling off. And then at the end of the meeting, I'm going to walk us through the kind of identity, vision, mission stuff that I think the Lord has given us for the road ahead here at Trinity Church, about which I am very, very excited. And so I hope, hope, hope that all of you will be around. Oh, also... Um, I found this out after the 930 service, so I couldn't tell everybody at the 930 service, uh, but there will be nursery care after everybody eats at annual meeting. So spread the word. Next, some of you probably saw it via email and you see it printed here. I threw out the idea of doing a short little three-week book study on a book called The Anglican Way because I believe it will complement what we're going to talk about tomorrow night very well. Uh, the response uh, to that has been really, really good. Uh, for which I'm grateful. So we're going to do the book study on uh, the next three Wednesdays, the 2nd, 9th, and 16th of February at 5.30 here at the church. If you responded uh, via email or through a Connect card or what have you, that you would like to be part of the book study and you don't have the book yet, there are a few of them still out here. And you can get it at a discounted rate here. It's like 18 bucks on Amazon, but you can get it here for 15 uh, And you can also download it on Kindle or what have you. And if you're interested in the book study but you can't do it this time, worry not, because we will revisit this book, I promise you. Uh, so yeah, there's that. 
Also, uh, there are blurbs in here both about Sunday morning fellowship, uh, bringing stuff to help folks socialize and fellowship between services and altar flowers, and uh, you can sign up for both of those here on your Connect page. The last thing I want to tell you about is last week, I had the opportunity to go down to Camp St. Christopher for our diocesan clergy conference, and um, good golly. First off, it was my first time at Camp St. Christopher, and I think I am now a lifelong devotee after three days there, and that, I'm sure that will surprise no one who's been down there. Uh, the other thing I do want to tell you is I did get to spend a little bit of time with our new bishop, and the rumors are true. Uh, he's at least as cool, if not even cooler, than all the rumors I've heard about him. Uh, just a genuinely humble, uh, wonderful pastor. Uh, and I know I speak on behalf of all the clergy in the diocese when I say we are excited and we are in good hands moving forward. Which leads me into the last thing I want to tell you. This is the first time I've been to a clergy conference in this diocese. Um, and I pinched myself all the way back up the road to Myrtle Beach. The clergy in the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina are incredible. Um, I, I don't, like I am not worthy to be in that company of godly, spirit-led leaders. I tell you that so that in your prayers you can join me in thanking God that the clergy, the rectors, the deacons in this diocese are, uh, they're just unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. The Lord uh, has his hand on the Diocese of South Carolina. Thanks be to God. And with that, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
hearts. Be the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own glorious light. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. The night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, 
whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let's go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.